real pleasure for me to introduce Joel Magnuson. You know, I was thinking that um, it's probably really evidence, uh, evident of hard times when economists are invited to come up and give uh, spe <laughs> keynote speeches. And, uh, you know, because our profession is called the dismal science, and, uh, you know, that's what we practice, and we talk about a lot of depressing stuff. But recently I went to uh, a, a presentation by a Jungian psychologist, and um, this psychologist said that, um, you know, basically in, the mo in our modern lives, we have essentially two choices, depression or anxiety. <laughs> so I thought what I would do uh, today is instead of make you depressed, I'm going to make you anxious. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> first thing I want to uh, really talk about is dissent and uh, the importance of a dissenting voice in American society and really what it means to be a dissenter. And um, when I think about, uh, you know, the role of a dissenter, uh, what comes to mind is Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who uh, passed away about a year ago. And Solzhenitsyn suffered imprisonment and exile for his writings that revealed human rights violations in the former Soviet state. And for his work, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1970. Um, he was heralded in the Western media as the lone heroic voice in a brutal totalitarian system. Solzhenitsyn was celebrated as a dissident icon and conservative intellectual, that is, until he, he moved to the United States and he turned that critical gaze onto the capitalist West. When he was here in the United States, uh, he made a number of, of speeches, and in his speeches he made it clear that he was no fan of state socialism, yet at the same time he lamented that Western cultures are morally weak, plagued with greed, decadence, and spiritual emptiness. He also argued that freedom of the press does not exist for readers or viewers in the United States as the corporate media largely stresses what's fashionable, fashionable opinions and views that conform to trendiness or what's profitable. In a 1978 address at Harvard University, he said the following, there is no open violence such as in the East. However, a selection dictated by fashion and the need to match mass standards frequently uh, prevents independently minded people from giving their contribution to public life. Solzhenitsyn concluded that he would not recommend Western society to replace Soviet communism. And there, soon afterwards, Solzhenitsyn's public, uh, public image in the media changed, and he went from an, uh, an idol to an old crank with outdated views. <coughs> we don't necessarily need to agree with his criticisms of the West, though we might consider what it means exactly to be a dissident in contemporary American society. What is a truly dissenting voice here? And more specifically, what is a dissenting view on the current economic and ecological crises that are crashing all around us? Um, it's true that we don't have gulags here, but I think Solzhenitsyn might have a point in stressing that a dissenting view is one that's not fashionable in the media. So this is where I come in. I want to encourage thinking but I don't want to say outside the box, I want to say outside the circle. Part of what, what makes something fashionable is reinventing it in new ways, but still doing the same things over and over again. Right now, what is particularly fashionable is the notion that we can effectively deal with our massive economic and ecological crises without having to make any fundamental changes in the way we live in the world or in the way we see the world. I challenge this view, and I want to encourage you also to think critically about this because this may be the most important juncture in our lives in the 21st century. I also want to encourage you not to think so much about whether or not you're conforming to conventional pieties or saying things that you think other people want to hear. I want you <laughs> You know, that's not a good sign. <laughs> crack down on dissent. Um, 
I want to encourage you to develop new and independent ways of thinking and acting and to break out of this vicious circle. And this is what I mean by the circle, the circle of habituation. That is, the circle of habitual ways of thinking about the world that reinforce our habitual ways of acting in the world, which reinforce our habitual ways of thinking about the world, and so on. In other words, I'm making a plea for real conscious change in our actions as well as our mindset. I say conscious change because real change is, in fact, coming whether we want it or whether we like it or not. The question is not whether, whether or not we can change. We will change eventually. The question is whether we can change in ways that are good for us and good for our planet. Societies in every part of the world are confronted with crises that are profound in scale. Global financial meltdown, global recession, global warming, global movements of social unrest. It's becoming clear that these crises are going to cause fundamental changes in how people live. And, these <laughs> and it's happening faster than we think. <laughs> just uh, pandemonium, really. <laughs> so if we accept, and I'm trying to be serious now, um, <laughs> if we accept that fundamental change is inevitable, then we're faced with a choice. We could choose to be forward thinking and work actively toward positive changes that will help us get to the other side of these crises in healthy and sustainable ways, or we can choose to be somnambulant and drift toward a time when change is forced upon us in the form of debilitating crises, punishing, punishing humanity and pushing us once again through a long historical period of decline, a kind of dark ages of the third millennium. Thinking critically and realistically about what things look like on the other side of this chasm, this deep economic chasm that we're in right now, and making the right choices for action is the central theme, is the central theme of this talk. Um, I want to focus on uh, economic crises as systemic, not cyclical. And I'm not trying to exploit people's fears with gloom and doom. Rather, I want to point out the magnitude of the problems that we face. The economic crisis that we are now experiencing is just, it's not just your normal business cycle downturn. It's a systemic problem, and it's global. The depression of the 1930s was systemic and global, and the New Deal stimulus package of that era did not turn it around. What changed things was war. This is not acceptable, and I really, really wish that people in this country would stop saying that war is good for the economy. As, Nobel, as much as Nobel laureate economist Paul Krugman is advocating for a return to New, New Deal policies, I think we can't. We can't go back. We can't look back. We have to look forward, and we have to move forward. In the 1930s, this was a different time when the United States was at the very beginning stages of a phenomenal period of industrial growth and development. We don't have that now, and everyone is desperately looking around to find the new thing, the new trick, the new industry that will send us into another long period of industrial growth and expansion. I'll return to this question of the economic recovery in a minute, but first I want to show you some numbers that uh, reveal the scale and magnitude of this economic crisis that we're in right now. Um, what I have here are the top ten bankruptcies of American history, and uh, there's a couple of things that I want for you to notice here. One of them is that eight of these top ten bankruptcies uh, occurred in the last eight years. So there's something going on in the, in, in the current decade that's very, very significant. The other thing that I want you to look at is the number one uh, bankruptcy, which was Lehman Brothers, that occurred in September uh, of 2008. And by, uh, by the way, September of 2008 was exactly when my book, Mindful Economics, was published. So uh, a lot of people accused me of orchestrating this financial crisis so that I could get my book out there. <laughs> I was really flattered by that. Um, <laughs> But if you, if you notice uh, the numbers, I mean, 25 billion here, 30 billion there, 60, WorldCom came in with a whopping 104 billion, and then 
uh, Lehman Brothers passed that previous record with the bullet and wiped out $639 billion. Uh, just to give you a sense of the scale of that, that's one single company bankruptcy and the dollar amount is greater than the gross state products of every state in the United States except California, Texas, New York, and Florida. Um, also, what, what we're seeing here is uh, uh, some pretty significant government deficit and debt problems. And here again, you know, if we look at like during the Bush years, 400 billion there, 490 billion, 500, so on, so on. But now, in our current period, the project, projected budget deficit is almost three times the previous record of one and a half trillion dollars. There's some other things that are going on in the housing sector. Uh, 1.35 million homes fell into foreclosure during the third quarter of 2008, which is a 76 percent increase over the previous year. For the month of November 2008, labor announced a stunning, at that time, it was a stunning number of 597,000 jobs that were lost in one month. And that was the worst monthly job loss in 34 years. This was then followed by some new records, a loss of 681,000 in December, 741,000 in January, 681,000 in February, 699,000 in March, and 539,000 jobs in April. And I found it really interesting that uh, in April, when, the, when labor reported 539,000 jobs lost, uh, people said, hey, you know, things are starting to look up. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, the, these numbers, and there's many other numbers uh, that show that our economy right now is in this very rapid downward spiral and so our government and various institutions are really scrambling to try to deal with this problem in in the ways that institutionally they deal with these problems by pa trying to patch up this stuff with bailout money. Um, I, I got this data from a Bloomberg, Bloomberg report and it's um, the amounts of money that the Federal Reserve the FDIC, the Treasury Department, and HUD have committed to trying to deal with this bailout and deal with this economic crisis. That's the left column. And the right column is how much they've already appropriated to deal with this, this problem. And if you look at how much they're, they're committed to this, $7.7 trillion from the Federal Reserve, our central bank, a little over $2 trillion from the FDIC, uh, to about $2.7 trillion from the Treasury Department, which includes TARP and the stimulus package and uh, both Bush and Obama stimulus packages and so on. The total amount, according to this report, is close to $13 trillion, and this is all borrowed money. So when we start tacking on finance charges and interest payments and all that sort of thing, then it's getting close to about $14 trillion. In other words, the amount committed to the bailout stands as the second highest GDP in the world, second Trump? only to the United States. Who did borrow Trump? Uh, bar well, I'm going to talk about that because um, part of what's going on is these institutions are now married with Wall Street institutions, and these Wall Street institutions, as they've coupled with government agencies, now have access to credit all over the world. So it's coming from everywhere. <clears throat> Just to give you a sense of the scale here, um, the, the second two largest economies behind the United States in the world is China has a GDP of seven trillion and Japan a GDP of four trillion. So you take those two countries, the two largest countries, second largest uh, economies in the world, you combine them together and it's still less than the amount our government institutions are committing to this bailout package. So. Here in the U.S., we have government that's committing and borrowing and spending or will spend $14 trillion to patch up a $14 trillion economy. Does anybody see anything wrong with that picture? <laughs> in essence, these bailouts, the Federal Reserve, the federal government are absorbing trillions in risk that have been building in our financial system for over a decade. Their purpose, they say, is to clean the balance sheets of banks so that they can t return 
to normal operations. As they clean the so-called toxic assets off the balance sheets of private banks, they're not making the problem go away. Rather, they're just moving it from one sector to another, from one sphere to another, swept under the rug and creating an illusion that something is actually being fixed. So how do we get into this mess? Well, uh, you know, this is a very complex problem, <coughs> and uh, I really don't have time to go into all of the things about credit default swaps and mortgage-backed securities and all this sort of thing. But, but what I want to do is just go, go right to what I think or what I submit is the root problem, at least in the financial sector and a few other sectors as well. I think the root problem is that we've allowed private sector companies to consolidate their industries and consolidate their powers in ways that we haven't seen since the old monopoly days of Standard Oil about a century ago. One of the most deeply rooted problems we are facing is this very situation of extreme concentration of financial and corporate power. Issues related to the dangers of corporate power are usually kept out of the media limelight, mainly because the corporate media itself is one of the most concentrated industries in the world. Now, occasionally they'll run a story about a bad apple here or there, but never addresses this problem as systemic. But this problem did come into full view when the economic crisis exploded last fall and a group of gigantic corporations from the banking, insurance, and auto industries descended on Wall Street like Godzilla, stomping about, shrieking for bailout money on the threat that the government will either comply or face the consequences of sacking potentially millions of jobs and plunging the U.S. economy into another Great Depression. These companies are able to get away with their reckless business practices in part because the practices themselves have been condoned by government officials. Over the last few decades, corporate mergers have ascended into unimaginable levels and each merger has been greeted by government regulators who sort of say something along the lines of, uh, well, congratulations, you're now too big to fail, seal of approval. Very few have raised, raised questions about how potentially dangerous this can be. That is until now that the monsters have real, uh, raised their ugly heads. Nonetheless, instead of taking this issue on directly, the Bush and Obama administrations and member of Congress have been scurrying in all directions, seeking ways to comply to the demands of these companies out of fear of being politically trampled. And as we can see from the numbers, this compliance is now coming at a staggering, staggering cost. By the way, this is nothing new. The United States has a long history of struggles against excessive corporate power. Nearly two centuries ago, Thomas Jefferson wrote in a, in a letter to a friend, quote, I hope we shall crush in its birth the aristocracy of our moneyed corporations which dare already to challenge our government to a trial of strength. In 1932, legal scholars Burl and Means studied the role uh, that corporations played after 1929. They published their conclusions in a book titled The Modern Corporation and Private Property, and in there they proclaimed, quote, the modern corporation may be regarded not simply as one form of social organization, but potentially as the dominant institution in the modern world. This was in 1932. By the 1950s and 60s, economist John Kenneth Galbraith also warned in his volumes of writings that the undemocratic power of gigantic corporate institutions enable them to not only dominate entire industries, but the political machinery of government as well. It seems that in the last few decades, though, all these warnings have been erased from the memories of American leaders in government. I think a turning point in this process of uh, memory going to amnesia happened when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in 1976 in Buckley versus Vallejo that uh, campaign money in electoral politics and legislation is protected under the uh, First Amendment. As the Supreme Court ruled that spending money is protected form of political expressions, then naturally the scales of power tipped heavily toward multi-billion dollar corporations and their lobbyists. From, from that point forward, what we've seen in American politics 
is a pattern, a pattern that's been replicated uh, many, many times uh, with some regularity. The first thing in this pattern is an anti-regulation movement within an industry uh, that, um, you know, comes from, uh, you know, corporations and their lobbyists who are really in a position to dominate a particular industry like Enron did back in the 1990s. And so they campaign for uh, a deregulation of that, of that industry. Um, <clears throat> Anti-regulation could include, you know, deregulation or having a Supreme Court that rules that a particular kind of regulation is not constitutional or having an executive branch of the government uh, simply not enforce those regulations or try to repeal those regulations. But whatever the form of anti-regulation, this anti-regulation movement takes, it's typically dressed up in language that suggests good intentions like efficiency and modernization. Once the companies are, are unleashed and, and uh, able to lay siege to their markets, then they pursue reckless business uh, practices and large-scale crises then inevitably follow. Though this, this pattern has been repeated again and again, there, again, there's this remarkable epidemic of amnesia that sets in, and uh, particularly among members of government and in the industry. Um, <clears throat> when Back in, in 1995, when the Mexican peso crisis hit, Newt Gingrich at that time was Speaker, uh, Speaker of the House on the Republican side. And he said, oh, well, you know, we've never really seen any, anything like this before. And then uh, when the East Asian financial crisis hit in the late 90s, then uh, Robert Rubin, Secretary of Treasury, said, oh, we've never really seen anything like this before. And then when the, the current banking crisis hit, uh, Robert Rubin once again said, oh, wow, we've never seen anything like this before. And Alan Greenspan got on the microphone and said, well, I'm really shocked at this. And so, you know, they keep saying this, oh, oh hell's bells. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> Giant corporations can, of course, justify being rescued by governments because in many ways they are too big, big to fail. That is, the threat of their failure will escalate into a much larger crisis. The urgency of the crisis then precludes any kind of long-term, forward-looking institutional reform that would prevent such crises from happening again in the future. So they just keep repeating over and over and over again. What we have right now is a continuation of this legacy. With the TARP and other banking industry bailouts, we've developed a systems condition that is potentially much worse and much more dangerous. And I want to say this very carefully. With these trillions in government investments in corporate securities and loan guarantees, the Treasury Department, which I'll remind you is part of the executive branch of the government, the Treasury Department, our central bank, the Federal, Re Federal Reserve System, and Wall Street have all merged together into one gigantic Enron-style investment banking or bank holding company joint venture. Despite the cries from right wingers in Congress, this is not a movement towards state, state socialism in which government appropriates business assets. This is the opposite. This is the private sector pulling the Fed and the federal government and their enormous access to credit and other resources around the world into their boardrooms. And then they close the door. When pressed, however, corporate leaders will occasionally talk about why they do what they do. And they always, they always give the same response. We have our shareholders to consider. Well, I have to say that they're not being entirely disingenuous when they say this. Um, <clears throat> they speak the truth about their fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. And once we start to realize this, once we start to recognize this, then this takes this problem or this issue right to the heart of the capitalist system itself. And I, I emphasize the word system because what we have in capitalism is really a kind of mutual support network in which government institutions like the Treasury and the Fed and HUD and the FDIC and corporations and mutual funds and pension funds and the World Trade Organization and the IMF and so on, all of these institutions are hanging together in this mutual uh, support network that we really ought to call 
capitalism because that's what it is. <clears throat> we cannot know for sure, but I think I have a pretty good guess as to what these guys are talking about in the boardrooms, if they're the good capitalist businessmen that I think they are. They're talking about how we're going to get this economy back on the road to growth. Economic growth is king. Economic growth is God, and it's the prime directive of all capitalist systems. So if we're, if we're serious about change and we're serious about stepping outside the circle, then I think we have to step into something that's enormously unfashionable in America. We have to face the possibility that capitalism as a system and its mutual support network cannot be sustained. Now maybe, uh, perhaps some of you right now are thinking, oh, this guy, uh, Joel Magnuson, he's a, he's a Marxist. He's a communist, a uh, socialist, or utopian, or idealist, or a devil, or Beelzebub, or something. Uh, <clears throat> whatever the handle people use when they want to, you know, red bait somebody for criticizing capitalism. And I, I, want, I want to encourage people to really uh, think about that and try to break away from this Cold War era way of thinking about economic systems, and that there are only these two choices, state socialism on the one hand, or capitalism on the other. Why are we so often given this black and white rubric uh, that there are only two, two possibilities and somehow we just can't imagine anything else? I mean, where are the free and the bold independent thinkers here? It makes me think of someone in the 18th or 19th century saying, well, we only really have two choices, slavery or colonialism. This kind of censorship of fashion constrains our thinking in ways that I think will most certainly prevent us from working toward real solutions. For a long time, people even wouldn't even uh, mention the word capitalism out of fear of being branded or red baited. Now, however, many are talking about capitalism, yet still in this very tentative way, in non-direct ways, with qualifiers like uh, it's corporate capitalism or global capitalism or market capitalism. Super capitalism, Robert Reich's book, disaster capitalism, Naomi Klein's book, American capitalism, laissez-faire capitalism, monopoly capitalism. It's like there's capitalism out there that somehow might be right or good. It's just kind of lost its path some way because it's been corrupted by these corporate institutions or by the market system or the global system or whatever. Um, but if we look historically from its inception 400 years ago to this day, Capitalism has always been corporate. It's always been global. It's always been market-oriented. And in many ways, it's always been disastrous. And perhaps what's most evident of this disaster is the fact that we're facing the need to spend $14 trillion to patch up a $14 trillion capitalist system or a capitalist machine. Now, if this machine were a car, what do you think the me mechanic in the repair shop would tell us? It's totaled, right? Get a bike. <laughs> That's part of the mindful economy. OK, so what about the recovery then? Let's forget all this other stuff, and let's just go back to the way things were. Um, putting aside conflict of interest and unsustainable debts and deficits, let's assume that we're going to jump back into the circle, jumpstart the economy with these bailouts, and return everything the way it was back in the, you know, the bubbly years of the 1990s. Where does the con economy go from here then? What is the current uh, uh, fashionable idea that's going to get the economy moving forward now? Uh, it seems like everybody's talking about green, greening up the, the, the economy, the green technology. Or there's this idea that we can use some green technology here, little, you know, greening up over here a little bailout, well, a lot of bailout and, uh, uh, you know, some money thrown around and, uh, you know, we can get back, to, back on track again, only we'll do it in a way that's cleaner and perhaps a little less vulgar than the way we were doing it before. Well, I dissent from this view. I particularly challenge the notion that the solution to our problems, our current problems in a progressive way, is creating green-collar capitalism to achieve the three E's of sustainability, you know, economy, ecology, and, and uh, equity. I believe that the three E's are 
valid goals, but I don't believe that they can be realized without fundamental systemic change that will take decades, probably, to bring about. Gene and Dick Roy, the Northwest Earth Institute, wrote in their newsletter that there's a kind of asymmetry among those three E's. There's too much emphasis played on the E of economy with the other two E's taking a subordinate position. The result, the Roy's write, is sustainability light or a half-hearted approach to ecological sustainability. The Roy's quote a typical business-oriented approach to sustainable practice, quote, I'm an advocate of sustainable practices so long as it increases the bottom line. Otherwise, how could I sell this approach to management? And of course, management would say, how can we sell this to our shareholders? Increasing the bottom line means increasing returns to capital investments, which also means growth. The nature of capitalism is such that economies must continue to grow or face failure. So let's look at some more numbers. <clears throat> um, there's uh, a kind of benchmark growth rate of 3%, at least historically. That's probably not a realistic number now, but historically, 3% was like the normal growth for an economy. Our current $14 trillion economy, if we grew at a rate of 3% annually, it would have to double every 24 years. So 14 trillion would turn into 28 trillion in the next 24 years, which would turn into 56 trillion 24 years after that. Uh, in other words, this year's high school graduates would see the U.S. economy grow to the, to the size of the entire world's economy by the time they retire at a modest 3% annual growth rate. Despite uh, recent drops in oil prices, energy is still scarce and will become scarcer. Atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide are soaring far above climatologists' expectations. The, global condi uh, the conditions of global warming are also soaring far above their expectations. The renewable energy sources of wind, solar, geothermal, biofuels, and hydrogen are relatively abundant. It's true. They're abundant resources. But what's not abundant is our ability to harness those resources. Uh, these, these resources are very sparse relative to fossil fuels. The thing about oil and coal is they're very, very dense energy resources. And so uh, if we try to you know, rely on these alternative uh, energy resources, then what we have to do is build massive, complex, and expensive infrastructure so that we can capture, concentrate, and harness those resources so that we can use them in the ways that we've been using oil and fossil fuels. Now, if we were to do this, and I again did, uh, again did some rough calculations here, just hypothetically, if we tried to solarize using the best available technology, the lowest cost in solar energy technology, it would cost about $20 trillion just to build the infrastructure now, that's $20 trillion that we would have to save up, you know, like putting in, in a piggy bank over time. We're going to save up $20 trillion so we can build this infrastructure. And so how much stuff would we have to sell in order to get some, you know, surplus or profit so that we can pay for this, uh, this infrastructure? And it's somewhere between $200 and $300 trillion. Well, it's just, just not possible. <clears throat> There's simply uh, only so many resources we can bring to bear in the production process. There are only so many toxins we can dump into the atmosphere. There are only so many markets within which we can sell, and there's only so many people with the purchasing power to buy. If we're to learn anything about the current economic crises we're facing, it's that we can no longer see the universe as an infinite resource pipeline. We can no longer see the planet as an infinite landfill and we can no longer see the government as an infinite lender of last resort. In other words, the growth imperative of capitalism in its global incarnation has finally hit the wall. So there's not going to be a, a, a Green New Deal, in fact. There's not going to be a green recovery or a new green-collar capitalism that will carry us into the next century. I think 
that this is just more spin on business as usual and truly sustainable business practices, they do exist, but they only exist and have existed in very, very slim margins in these very small, tucked away places in our economy. And as I said before, people right now in this crisis are looking around for the new thing, the new trick, the new industry that's going to carry the mantle of growth long into the future. And now it seems that all eyes have now turned on green business. Suddenly this tiny little margin of the economy is the go-to guy. This, I think, is a gross perversion of the sustainability movement and would be nothing more than temporary greenwashed industry bubbles into which Wall Street is going to sink its fangs. And while the financial instruments that they create to finance this bubble will be inflated and deflated and inflated and deflated, the planet is going to be brought to its knees with exha exhaustion. So what do we do? I think the first step is to step out of the circle and break free of this mindset and this blind sublimation of capitalism and its growth imperative. Growth and consumerism are deeply rooted elements in our culture and our mindset, but we have to find ways to dig ourselves out of that, and I'm hopeful that we can. In the mindful economics movement, we do, we do see hope. Our hope is not based on an ideological blueprint or a violent revolution under a Marxist banner that promises to usher in a new era. Rather, it's based on the real proactive work that people are actually doing. People are actively bringing about meaningful change where they have the most democratic control in their local communities. Redolent of the popular bumper sticker, Think Globally, Act Locally, the mindful economics movement is think and act globally and locally. More importantly, though, it's to begin planting the seeds of thoroughgoing systemic change in local community-based reform movements infused with a broader holistic vision. I mentioned earlier that centralization is a root, pro a root problem. The logical path toward change, therefore, is localization and decentralization. If the federal government is playing the role of economic czar, then we as citizens need to make them, make them take that role seriously. As it builds its portfolio of nationalized banking assets, it can also work toward decentralizing that industry by redistributing those assets to the thousands of small community-based depository institutions like local savings banks, credit unions, and financial cooperatives. Restrictions can be imposed on those assets that they only be used to give financial support for locally based economic alternatives, particularly in small scale renewable energy infrastructure. This may not be uh, achieving all of our goals at once, but at least if we start to decentralize the financial sector uh, and some bad decisions were made on a decentralized basis on a smaller scale, then those bad decisions won't be dragging the entire planet into some kind of financial disaster or calamity. The impetus for, for developing these economic alternatives could be spearheaded with government grants and public, work, public works projects. Um, <clears throat> I mean, one of the ways that I think that we could finance this, and again, this is a, another not very fashionable uh, proposal, but I think that uh, we could very easily finance uh, a lot of development projects by increasing the top marginal tax rate on the wealthy and the ultra-wealthy in this economy. And why not? <clears throat> um, you know, income and wealth distribution are the most polarized they've been since the depression of the 1930s and far, far more unequal than they are in our tr with our trading partners in Europe or Japan. Uh, by the way, we've allowed the top 10 and 1% uh, of our population to amass huge fortunes. And collectively, these fortunes amount to a kind of cloud. Imagine this cloud of speculative liquidity that's just kind of floating around the planet looking for a, a, a kind of investment bubble to sort of descend on. So this cloud floats around, 
and it settles over here on the housing market and it goes through a boom bust cycle and it lifts off. Or it descends over here on soybeans beans because uh, you know they're speculating on the uh, biofuels industry and soybeans go through boom and bust and they, the cloud lifts off and then it settles on mortgage backed securities and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> here's this very, very affluent 1% of our population that have been allowed since probably 30 years to collectively pool all of this money together, not for public purpose, not for investment, but for speculation. And that's a key part of this problem of centralization and, and, and also a key cause for instability. <clears throat> I could go down a, a much longer list of, of reform movements, but um, I want to talk about whether or not you think this kind of, these kinds of, pro of proposals, breaking down these gigantic uh, financial institutions, decentralization, reallocation of resources, I want to, to find out if you think this sounds unrealistic. Well, um, one thing that we should remember is that we've actually done this before. We've actually done this. John D. Rockefeller, Standard Oil Company, controlled 90% of America's oil industry. American Telephone and Telegraph, AT&T, had a monopoly control over the entire country's telephone system. An investment banker, J.P. Morgan, combined his resources with the Rockefellers to form the ultimate corporate giant known as the Northern Securities Corporation. These and many other corporate superpowers were broken down by the sheer will of political activism and viable trust-busting leadership. At the same time J.P. Morgan was building his financial empire in the late 19th century, people in local communities began to realize that Morgan was not going to serve their interests, and they began to develop their own community-based alternatives. And this was, at least in the United States, where we saw the origin and growth and development of small-scale community-based savings banks uh, and credit unions and financial cooperatives that are still around today. We're doing many other things. Giant corporations, for example, were driving out small family farms. So with our instincts to survive, we developed farmers markets everywhere simultaneously. And we didn't need to stage a bloody revolution to do it. Most importantly, I think, is to break out of our habituated mindset. And this is really kind of uh, a core idea of mindful economics, to build our own mindful economy, our own sort of uh, healthy, not pathological, but healthy mutual support network. We need to break out of our habituated uh, way of thinking and a habituated way of doing things and openly embrace the idea that we have no choice but now do things in a different way. If we look into our hearts with mindfulness, without delusion, I believe that we'll be able to uh, see that we're all essentially going to come to the same conclusion, that we'll naturally gravitate toward models of social fairness, environmental sustainability, and stability. And getting there doesn't have to be painful. Nor do we have to live in a world that was seen by Solzhenitsyn as morally weak, decadent, greedy, and spiritually empty. Looking deep into our hearts with mindfulness, we can find instead moral strength, compassion, discipline, and spiritual fullness. From this heart, we can actively and democratically take part in building economic alternatives that are consistent with our sense of justice and sustainability. From this heart also flows a set, a set of values of nonviolence to each other and to nature which leads to an ever-widening conception of sustainability and community and a sense of responsibility to society and maintaining the life-giving vibrancy of a stable community. With time, practice, and reflection, people can see a mindful economy begin to flourish. In a mindful economy, households are still locked together with businesses through a network of markets, but unlike a pathological system and capitalism with endless growth and speculation and consumerism, they're brought together by shared values and a commitment to principles of a wholesome livelihood. Monetary and banking systems can be and are, be, are being uh, redirected and recreated to be democratically controlled 
in local community-based financial cooperatives. They're also infused with the principles of wholesome livelihoods. Unlike the predatory impulses of Wall Street institutions, the financial system of a mindful economy also serves the true needs of communities by providing financial resources for development, homes, public works projects, education, and stability. Over time, this could evolve into a full-fledged system that might actually let us survive. And by the way, every large-scale system, every large-scale institution has its own acorn to oak tree development experience. Microsoft was once a, a, an idea in someone's basement. Walmart started as a, a local five and dime shop in Arkansas. And Starbucks was a local coffee merchant in the old part of Seattle's downtown area. They evolved. But their own pathologies uh, also brought them, uh, are bringing them now to the brink of extinction. Our alternatives can also evolve, but not out of despair or cynicism, but with hard work, commitment, and a faith in humanity. Thank you. I can take some questions if you like, or if people uh, want to. Um, yeah, you mentioned um, the, the pathology of certain businesses being nearing extinction. You mentioned Walmart is one of them. Last I've heard, Walmart has suffered five quarters of record-breaking profits. Um, are you talking about the model of that business or that one in particular or that their boom simply cannot be sustained? It, that's what I mean is that, that uh, Walmart is a business model that it cannot be sustained because uh, it's really based on, on a couple of principles. One of them is that it's producing things in places around the world where people work for, you know, what, 25 cents an hour or something like this, and then they ship them all over the world. Uh, and I think that energy resources are getting more and more expensive to the point where I think that that's not going to be a sustainable model anymore. Um, Perhaps you can answer for me a question that I haven't been able to get a clear answer on for 15 years of trying. Can you define for me the essence of capitalism as opposed to other approaches? Yes. What makes capitalism capitalism as opposed to something else? Uh, yes. Um, it's essentially, capitalism has five elements to it. Uh, the first element is that it's based on an institution of private property, the private ownership of business assets. Uh, another element is that it, it has to work in a market system where uh, commodities and resources are turned into money and then money is, is turned back into products and products are turned into money again. So we need to have a system of market set up both on the resource side and the goods side to have a capitalist system. It also Wait, uh, when you say money, you mean coins money? Any kind of money, any, whatever the form of money. It, the, the, the essence of a market system is that it's money for commodity exchange. And capitalism is rooted in that. It's a money-based system and a property-based system. Uh, also, it's, uh, its prime directive or prime motivation is profit and returns to investors. Um, there's another element to it, and there's this sort of fundamental separation of ownership and work. So there's like people that own the financial resources, but they don't actually do the work. And then there's people that do the work, but they don't own any of the resources. So, you know, if you just look at the word capitalism, you know, capital means property. It's a system that revolves around the ownership of property. And then also, uh, it's a system that sort of baked into the cake is the growth imperative. It has to grow. It's, it's like, uh, that's the heartbeat. So you take those things and you put them together, you know, the system of private property, system of markets, the growth uh, uh, imperative, the profit motive, the separation of ownership and work, and you create a set of institutions that facilitate that, and you have capitalism.
Uh, in the May Atlantic, there was an article by a former IMF official who said that if the United States came to them as a generic country, uh, he would, they would just naturally nationalize these big finance companies, purge their assets, resell them, and break up the ones that are too big to fail. Is that essentially uh, what you'd see with these? Um, I don't know about that part of it. I, I maybe. I mean, it would be case-by-case case basis, but usually what the IMF recommends are austerity programs where they go in and they say, well, you, you have to cut your government spending down to this very small percentage of your GDP, so we need to close down your schools and your hospitals and all these kinds of things, and you have to open up your markets to international investment and, uh, you know, and it usually kind of destroys uh, people's livelihoods when they follow those models. But it, it helps the banks, you know, which is the IMF's main goal. There's some other women. We've got one more back here. When I was an undergraduate at the University of Tulsa in the 1970s, um, the economics professors I had at the time had us reading E.F. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful, and an awful lot of what you're saying takes me right back there several decades. It seems like this mindful uh, economics is really coming out of that same paradigm yes. that Schumacher was suggesting um, quite some time back. Yeah, is that uh, true? Uh, well, yeah, Schumacher wrote Small is Beautiful. Uh, I think it was published in like 1973. And, and then it, his appropriate technology and and I think it, uh, his focus was on countries that were trying to follow some gigantic development model that you would see in, in the West, in the United States or in Western Europe, you know, the Aswan Dam or something like this. And, and it really caused a lot of problems for the people that were living on the land. And so the movement toward appropriate technology and, and small is beautiful is this idea that we will try to foster the technology that would be appropriate for these communities on a much smaller scale that would sort of nestle into the communities rather than <coughs> plow them over. But uh, he, he also studied, uh, you know, different development experiences in, in mostly, you know, some of them in Asia. And uh, he had this little chapter on Buddhist economics. And so that, uh, Part of the work that I do is I'm, I'm part of this group. It's called the Buddhist Economic Research Platform, and it's based in Cambridge, England, and Budapest, Hungary. And you know, we're not really you don't have to be Buddhist or practicing Buddhist to be a part of this, but it's really kind of following that tradition of E. F. Schumacher. So maybe some of you picked up on that that you know the the whole mindful thing is kind of uh, coming out of that tradition. Yeah. Thank you, Joel. Um, yeah. It occurs to me that you are quite the heretic, um, for which I applaud you and thank you. Uh, thank you. I, <laughs> I, I hope that it has the same impact as the 95 theses that Martin Luther banged on the door. And I'm wondering, like, honestly, are you beginning to see a cohesion around other economists who are ac actually talking about the, the kind of limits to the natural world and trying to acknowledge a, an economic theory or a, uh, that, that comes out of that kind of reality. Because frankly, my conversations with economists, they always assume crazy shit, you know? <laughs> and like, so you can't even have a conversation based in reality because they want to assume things that aren't real. So I'm just curious, are you seeing this kind of thing bubble up within the, econo in, within the discipline? Um. Well, I tend to I tend to s sort of uh, travel in in a herd of fellow dissidents, you know, and uh, we don't get invited to a lot of the the mainstream conferences, and uh, um, but you know, surprisingly, that after my book came out, I, I I really thought that I would be you know attacked, and and so far not at all. I've received a lot of v very very positive reviews on the book, and I think that.
in some ways, the, one of the good things that are coming out of this, this, these crises that we're in right now is that um, this deeply entrenched way of looking at economics academically, you know, in college and universities is, you know, it's really starting to kind of break apart a little bit. Uh, granted, I think that we're a very, very small minority, but, um, you know, this is changing. And I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of, of economists now, like um, I, I, in the introduction to my book, I, I quote all these Nobel, Nobel laureate economists that were very mainstream, we call it neoclassical, very mainstream neoclassical uh, economists that got the Nobel Prize and then they were saying stuff like, you know what, uh, this is a lot of bullshit, <laughs> you know, kind of, you know, in the hallways, they would make, you know, make these kind of confessions. So I think that people are, are really starting to come out and uh, uh, be more open about this. And I, I know that uh, where I work, Portland State University and, and Portland Community College, we're seeing, you know, a lot more open-mindedness, you know, and it's, you know, individually, economists, I think, still t tend to be kind of rigid and, and conservative, you know, and, and, and sort of reluctant to change. But, you know, I'm hopeful. You know, I think that this is a, a good thing that's coming out of this crisis right now. So let's give a big hand for Joel Magnuson. Thank you.